Hello everyone. Tonight I want to talk to you about aluminum and vaccines. And specifically I want to talk to you about AAHS, which stands for Amorphous Aluminum Hydroxyphosphate Sulfate. What I'm going to reveal to you tonight is a history of silent complicity by drug manufacturers. And what you might find here is a startling history that stems back probably into the 1960s or even beforehand. Information that has, as far as I know, not been revealed to the public and put together in the way that I'm putting it together tonight. It's going to seem like I'm going off on a few tangents when I tell you this, but in order to give you the full picture of the silent complicity and what appears to me to be some corruption in the history of vaccination and why some of the previous vaccines in the 1960s, 70s, 80s might have seemed to be extremely toxic, you'll need to have this background information. So bear with me if it seems like I'm going off on a tangent. You will actually understand why I'm filling in the picture this way. So I just want to start with a study that I went over last month when I was on the Vaxxed bus. And I talked about some unsettled science in relation to the discovery of flawed computer software that's been used for over a decade, which could potentially invalidate over 40,000 studies, which defined the analysis of certain MRI research and diagnoses. So when I hear about a software issue which effectively nullified thousands of studies, the first question that comes up in my mind is, what else could either be hidden away or not yet discovered? Or what could be known about and kept quiet? How much science today is supposedly settled, yet another good look underneath a few rocks might completely change the whole landscape? In order to get to the core of what I want to reveal to you today, we have to start with a strangely titled article called Approaching the Asymptote, Evolution and Revolution in Immunology, where the renowned immunologist, Dr. C.A. Janeway, described aluminum as the immunologist's dirty little secret. But there's a bigger secret about aluminum, which has gone untold until now. And as I explain this secret, you'll see why no one has talked about the bigger picture. But first, let's talk about Janeway's dirty little secret, which was aluminum mixed with mycobacterium tuberculosis organisms, which together served as an effective adjuvant. And for those of you who don't know, an adjuvant is something that stirs up the immune system and makes the vaccine cause more inflammation and thus work better. In the case of Cervarix vaccine, it's not mycobacterium TB, but dead salmonella bacteria particles mixed with aluminum hydroxide. Gardasil doesn't need the dead salmonella bacteria because the type of aluminum they use is highly potent without the dirt of added bacteria. So what are the different kinds of aluminum available for use in vaccines? Caulfield in 2007 discussed the different types in an article and in essence described why Merck probably chose to use amorphous aluminum hydroxyphosphate sulfate or AAHS. He explained that out of all three types, it gave a huge prolonged antibody level, which was way in excess of that produced by natural infections. And the medical system always loves more antibody because they assume that more is better. I used to think that the type of aluminum adjuvant is listed on every vaccine's package insert, which are also available online that look like this one here from the original Gardasil. Gardasil 9 doubled the amount of AAHS to 500 micrograms, even though early Gardasil had 250 micrograms per injection. Of all the vaccines in 2017, parents report Gardasil to be the most reactive vaccine in adolescence. The stories we hear and the cases I've seen are horrendous. There's something about Gardasil which hits some children's immune systems viciously. Given that we know the adjuvant is in the vaccine in order to light a fire in the body and trigger inflammation, we need to ask the question, what else is happening with Gardasil? Why does Gardasil seem to stand out amongst all other vaccines given today? According to the authorities, nothing is happening. As one Danish authority named Henrik G. Jensen said, 
The problem we have is that these teenagers can tell us what they are feeling, and babies simply cannot. I've noticed that the fainting girls are said to be hysterical. The ones that become wheelchair bound are considered to have bad luck. And the hunt for multiple sclerosis and other neurologic diseases is undertaken with futility, while doctors usually insist the one thing they do know is that the vaccine isn't responsible. The system says that Gardasil is a wonderful vaccine. Paul Offit literally described it as a beautiful vaccine. And thus, vocal parents of damaged girls are considered to have Munchausen's by proxy. Merck's adjuvant AAHS, amorphous aluminum hydroxyphosphate sulfate, is frequently described as Merck's proprietary compound. So what exactly is it? And how does it differ from other aluminum types in vaccines? This is what the three major types of aluminum look like under high magnification. Note the profound difference in structure and appearance between aluminum hydroxide, which is crystalline in nature and forms linear strands, that's noted on the left of this slide, and the other two adjuvants, amorphous aluminum hydroxyphosphate sulfate, which is in the middle, and amorphous aluminum phosphate, which is on the right, both of those form an amorphous mesh. AAHS was chosen for Gardasil because, compared to the other two adjuvants, it binds better to the protein antigen and provokes a bigger immune system bonfire with more antibodies. If you read Caulfield's article, which is noted at the top with PMID numbers, as are all my references, you'll see that all three aluminum adjuvants work in different ways and have different properties of adhesion, antigen presentation, and therefore, the body processes them quite differently. This is vitally important to understand because these adjuvants are really not just interchangeable. If AAHS is physically and functionally different from all other aluminum adjuvants and is a proprietary product, where is the discover, discovery and relevant FDA safety studies? It's assumed that what's listed on the package insert of any vaccine is what's in the vial. So each vaccine that's made on one of these three different compounds, which affect the immune system differently, should state which form of aluminum is in there, shouldn't it? And you would also think that all the other vaccine ingredients would be just what the labels say, but are they? If a label says six jelly beans, three peanuts, and one M&M, that's what should be in the bottle and nothing else, right? Not when it comes to vaccines. Back in 1984, a newspaper called the Fresno Bee, which I am showing you the clipping for, brought to the public's attention the fact that the stated ingredients in the whole cell pertussis vaccines were meaningless. Now, it might seem irrelevant that I'm now talking about whole cell pertussis vaccines, but hang in there with me. A pediatrician in California called Dr. Kevin Garrity had obtained information which showed that even the FDA knew that the endotoxin levels of vaccines could vary from 7.25 protective units to 37.33 protective units, but the label said that there were 12. How is it that what is said on the label is not what's in the bottle? Well, that's simple. The manufacturing process precludes exact quantification into a vial. Everything stirred, suspended in liquid form, which is then nozzle fed into 0.5 ml portions onto bottles on a conveyor belt. Hence, vaccine ingredients are not counted out like jelly beans into a jar. Six years later, scientists took several batches of whole cell pertussis vaccines and quantified the toxin levels and presented this information to the National Academy of Sciences Committee which was reviewing adverse consequences of whooping cough vaccines. And they too found what the FDA already knew, which was that the endotoxin levels varied hugely from bottle to bottle. They went one step further and compared an infant dose of endotoxin to what a normal healthy adult volunteer would get. And for those of you who don't know what endotoxin is, it's basically the poison that pertussis bacteria puts out. And that poison is actually put into the vaccine in order to stimulate an immune response. 
So babies were receiving anywhere between 25 to 672 times the dose, which could start to create symptoms in an adult. Every child is unique. Some children could react to 0 0.5 micrograms per ml. However, ask yourself how an infant or child might react to 26.9 micrograms per ml. The response of the medical system to DPT or any other vaccine has long been that the problem wasn't caused by the vaccine. We are told that if adverse events really happened, then more people would have the same reactions at the same time intervals. While I know that people cannot be standardized, I used to think that vaccines could be, but they're not. While the label can say one thing, we can't know for sure if the contents match. And with Merck's AAHS, there's another problem. And that can be seen on Merck's method for preparation of amorphous aluminum hydroxyphosphate, which is slightly different to the compound in Gardasil, <clears throat> amorphous aluminum hydroxyphosphate sulfate. Merck doesn't own a specific, a specific patent for AAHS, which is the compound in Gardasil, even though they call it their proprietary blend. We're told that the federal regulations which control vaccine manufacturers are tight and squeaky clean that the FDA and the DBS before them force manufacturers to always have accurate labeling. But standardization of aluminum is a problem because particle sizes vary, which presents consistency problems, and Merck says that they need better methods to standardize the aluminum hydroxyphosphate. As just one example of many I could give you regarding the inability to standardize a live virus vaccine, I quickly want to show you that MMR isn't standardized either. The European Medical Agency openly admits in a discussion document that in their two licensed MMR vaccine products, there are what they call degradation products. The quote you see here is an MMR variant called ProQuad, which is MMR with chickenpox. The other is called MMR VaxPro. So I want to draw your attention to the yellow quote that says, degradation products are neither identified nor quantified. <clears throat> so what are degradation products? Humans have degradation products. They're removed from the body into the toilet. Vaccine degradation products are cellular waste which form as part of the breaking down of nutrients and cells used for viral culture, and they have nowhere to go, so they remain in the culture medium because the vaccine system is a closed one and has no way of discarding its byproducts. They cannot purify or remove the degradation products because if they did, the viruses which were cultured would be killed or filtered away. So what does it say on the ProQuad package insert? Here's the ingredient list and you don't see degradation products listed. So where did they go? Could it fall into the category of other buffer and media ingredients? I really don't know. Do you really think that what it says on the label is all that's injected into a vaccine recipient? Do you think that the actual quantities listed are accurate? When they manufactured ProQuad or Gardasil, how does the company remove the degradation products from those vaccines? Are they identified, quantified, or just assumed to be removed? Thinking through history, can you think of any other vaccine used in children which was as reactogenic as Gardasil? The only other aluminum adjuvanted vaccine in history which led to so many disastrous reactions and which provoked just as big a storm of protest in the 1970s and 80s was the old whole cell diphtheria, pertussis, and tetanus shot. The reactions it caused were largely responsible for the 1986 National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act. Assuming the labels were correct and that aluminum was generally regarded as safe, Scientists decided that the problem with reactogenicity of the DPT vaccine was the pertussis endotoxin level. No serious consideration was given to the mere presence of aluminum. These are package inserts from the old DPT and DT vaccines. Note aluminum phosphate and aluminum potassium sulfate are listed. The diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis vaccines are made separately and then combined at the end into one vial. Measles, mumps, and rubella vaccines are made separately and then combined into one vial. 
Gardasil antigen types are made separately and then combined into one vial. And how did they count all those jelly bean antigens? In 1984, the Fresno Bee article reported honestly that there was no standard and the different lots differed. Some doctors genuinely thought that the problem was just the whooping cough toxin and told parents that they would drop the pertussis part and just inject the diphtheria and tetanus toxoids, which were available separately. <coughs> Yet interestingly enough, in the British National Childhood Encephalopathy Study set up in 1976, a puzzling conundrum rose. The children who just got diphtheria and tetanus could also react badly. That's described in a court case transcript that I have. And here's the front page. And I don't have time to get into all these details. But for now, just know that there are numerous references to the fact that the diphtheria and tetanus vaccine was also very reactogenic and that the reports of those reactions were hugely underplayed. Even though doctors thought DT alone would be safer, many parents discovered to their cost that the DT was often just as bad and the damage continued. So with that in mind, consider what these package inserts might not have said. Sherodkar in 1990 took a closer look at Wyeth and Connaught's DT vaccines and tested the adjuvants, the types of aluminum, which were labeled as aluminum phosphate and aluminum hydroxide. He found that the Wyeth vaccine shown here was labeled aluminum phosphate, but was not aluminum phosphate but was actually amorphous aluminum hydroxyphosphate, which is the one I showed you earlier in the three panel slide, the one off to the right, that Merck admitted could not be standardized. Connaught's vaccine was listed as aluminum potassium sulfate on the old labels, but was actually amorphous aluminum hydroxyphosphate sulfate, which is the same adjuvant that's used in Gardasil. So, both the DT manufactured by Wyeth and Connaught, which were then combined with the pertussis toxin, were not made on the form of aluminum listed on the label, but were made on a continuum of amorphous aluminum hydroxyphosphate or Gardasil's amorphous aluminum hydroxyphosphate sulfate. And given that this AAHS was manufactured by accident and not by design, and that in 2013, we know that there are consistency problems admitted by Merck with aluminum amorphous hydroxyphosphate. How on earth could the labels of any of the old DPT vaccines have ever been accurate? Here are the package inserts for today's acellular DTAP vaccines, which are definitely less reactive but knowing how the old vaccines were mislabeled, can we really trust today's labels to give us accurate quantities, constituents, and types of aluminum? Is Sanofi's aluminum phosphate standardized, or is it amorphous aluminum hydroxyphosphate sulfate that you see on the blue arrow that is so difficult to standardize? It's difficult for me to believe the list, particularly knowing that in 1992, Connaught's acellular package insert that you see here described the manufacturing process for aluminum potassium sulfate in similar terms to those used by Sherrod Carr when he said results in AAHS, the same adjuvant that is in Gardasil. Note that this vaccine also contained polysorbate 80, which is also in Gardasil. In case you missed that, the diphtheria and tetanus toxoids that make up the highly problematic whole cell diphtheria, pertussis, and tetanus vaccines contain the same adjuvant, amorphous aluminum hydroxyphosphate sulfate, as is used today in Gardasil. <clears throat> Given that it was discovered by accident to have been the result of a process used by manufacturers, it's little wonder that Merck doesn't have a specific patent for the discovery of AAHS. So, how is it that Merck calls AAHS its proprietary product? Unfortunately, the dirty secrets don't stop with DPT and Gardasil vaccines. This hepatitis B vaccine package insert from 1987 says it contains 
aluminum hydroxide. <clears throat> but Merck wrote a letter to MedSafe in New Zealand, which is my home away from home, to get the description changed to match the actual content, which was amorphous aluminum hydroxyphosphate, and said it has always been used in that vaccine, which means the Merck hepatitis B vaccines were mislabeled for over a decade with a type of aluminum that is probably more reactogenic and definitely more difficult to standardize. Vacta is one of New Zealand's hepatitis A vaccines. Its 1994 package insert also said it contained aluminum hydroxide. But in 2001, Merck requested that MedSafe of New Zealand change the description to amorphous aluminum hydroxyphosphate sulfate, again citing Dr. Sherodkar's article from 1999 and saying that they had always used AAHS, the same adjuvant used in Gardasil. So for years, everyone assumed that Merck's hepatitis B and Vacta contained the aluminum hydroxide when they actually contained the AAH or AAHS, which is seen on the right, which as we know from Dr. Caulfield's study, both affect the immune system differently and are processed differently by the body. <coughs> Here is one of today's Merck hepatitis B vaccine package inserts for Recombivax HB, but they also manufacture HB VaxPro. Both have the same wording that you can see above, but today they state that it contains AAHS, the same adjuvant that's in Gardasil, and not amorphous aluminum hydroxide. So they've done another switch in labeling, but note the very careful wording at the bottom where it says previously referred to. So let's put this all together. We know from the work done on Gardasil that AAHS is a far more powerful adjuvant than aluminum hydroxide or aluminum phosphate. Given that sulfate was used as a buffer in all whole cell pertussis vaccines, one question I have is, are the whole cell vaccines presently used in Brazilian mothers who subsequently had microcephalic babies and still used in other countries in the world, still adjuvanted with AAHS and still mislabeled? I have no idea. Could it be that the whole cell vaccine was so reactive because as Sherodkar showed, it was adjuvanted onto something completely different to what the manufacturers thought they had used? Could the problems with jaundice and SIDS in newborn infants in the United States be a result of AAHS in Merck's hepatitis B vaccines? I was unable to tell which hepatitis B vaccine is more commonly given to newborns in the USA because we have two options, one of which is not Merck's. But I know that the New Zealand Merck hepatitis B vaccine at birth had a lot of reactions which mimicked serious disease, and that vaccine was struck off the newborn schedule and then later added back in at six weeks of age for babies of non-carrier mothers. But New Zealand uses GlaxoSmithKline's hepatitis B vaccine now and not Merck's. So this all raises huge questions. So we now know that all Merck's vaccines have always used AAHS in them. We also know that Connaught and Wyeth's whole cell DPT vaccines were based on AAH or AAHS because they used a sulfate buffer which changed both the conformation and the potency of the aluminum. It is odd that Merck's HPV vaccine patent application from 2012 state something called MAA, which is interchangeable with AAHS. Connaught and Wyeth both used AAHS before 1990. I can't find Merck's patent for the discovery of a proprietary adjuvant specifically called AAHS. Supposedly, the method described for amorphous aluminum hydroxyphosphate covers all AAH adjuvants, including AAHS. But what are the implications of the fact that for decades the labels have not accurately described the aluminum adjuvants? The first implication is that this information totally nullifies the Cochrane Review on Aluminum from 2004, published in Lancet. 
which I've been highly critical of for several years now. Dr. Thomas Jefferson thought that they were investigating aluminum hydroxides or aluminum phosphates, when in fact, many of the vaccines they reviewed were actually adjuvanted on AAHS. So if you recall, the, the conclusions of this study were that replacement of aluminum compounds in currently licensed vaccines would necessitate the introduction of a completely new compound that would have to be investigated before licensing. No obvious candidates to replace aluminum are available, so withdrawal for safety reasons would severely affect the immunogenicity and protective protective effects of some currently licensed vaccines and threaten immunization programs worldwide. I believe that's why they came to the conclusion, even though they knew there could be serious problems with the aluminum in these vaccines. Any negative results on safety would indeed have threatened immunization programs worldwide, requiring product withdrawal, new safety studies, and pre-licensure trials in order to be licensed. The fact is that by 2004, vaccine manufacturers knew full well that their labeling was false and never informed Dr. Tom Jefferson. They chose to leave that information buried in the medical and regulatory information out of the sight of scientists and the public. It was convenient to them to allow people to believe the myth that apples were being compared with apples when in fact, Dr. Tom Jefferson was comparing apples and pears and watermelons. Strangely, Dr. Jefferson concluded that despite lack of good quality evidence, there should be no further research on the topic. My opinion is that perhaps another investigation as to why there is lack of good quality information is badly needed because the information I've presented would vastly change the face of research into vaccine reactions. <clears throat> It's almost as important as the recent finding that there is indeed a lymphatic system that drains from the brain. In the past, inconsistencies in the reaction rates with various DPT vaccines were dismissed as unfathomable. Maybe it would have been fathomable if the labels reflected what was really in vaccines. Maybe it would be fathomable if people realized that every vial is not the same as the next vial and every child is different. <clears throat> I don't know about you, but I see an enormous elephant in the room. It was to Merck's advantage not to have a factual adjuvant review done, which looked at the safety of all forms of aluminum because questions would have been raised as to whether or not AAHS in the whole cell DPT vaccines contributed to the reactogenicity of the pertussis toxins. Questions might have been asked about the dismissal of complaints about the DT vaccine with the assumption that it was only the pertussis toxin that was the problem, which was largely believed back then. Questions might have been asked as to why the early Merck hepatitis B vaccine created such devastating side effects in France, New Zealand, and elsewhere. Everyone thought those vaccines were made on aluminum hydroxide when indeed they were made on the same adjuvant used in Gardasil today, which is causing enormous reactions in our young teenagers. We know that Frunz adjuvant was removed from the market because it was highly toxic. Well, what would have happened if a comparison was made between Frunz adjuvant plus TB bacteria and Connaught and Wyeth's AAH and AAHS plus whole cell bacteria? One unifying concept which could explain the immunologic storm created by Connaught and Wyeth's whole cell DPT vaccine Merck's hepatitis B vaccine and Merck's Gardasil vaccine is amorphous aluminum hydroxyphosphate sulfate. But the goose that lays the golden egg must be protected at all costs. Manufacturers don't want to rock the myth of accurate labeling. They want vaccine reactions to continue to be categorized as coincidence. After all, ignoring the problems from one golden egg leads to the survival of other lucrative golden egg laying geese. Thank you. <laughs>